Welcome back to Logic 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on implications in truth tables. Let's kick off with a slight amount of review. Here's a truth table for the implication if P then Q. Remember that we start a truth table off by creating columns for each simple sentence in the overall big sentence. So here there's just two, P and Q. Then we create additional columns for each more complicated sentence after that. Here there's only one more complicated sentence, if P then Q, the conditional itself. I'm leaving the other two columns blank for now. We'll fill them in in a moment. Then we fill in the rows for each combination of truth value for the simple sentences. So we've seen that pattern before. And then using those combinations of truth values, we fill in the following columns. Well, here we have one more column to fill in, and it's a conditional. And if you remember back to our first lecture when I introduced conditionals to you, you might remember that I told you that the conditional is true if the antecedent is true and the consequent is true as well, or if the antecedent is false. The only way that an implication is false is if the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. So if we fill it in, we have it looking like this. So in the first row, both the antecedent and consequent, P and Q, are true, so the implication is true. For the bottom two rows, the antecedent is false, so the implication is true. And it's only in that second row where the antecedent is true, P is true, but Q, the consequent, is false. So here, it's not the case that P is actually implying Q, because we have P being true, but we have Q not being true. So we fill in the column for the implication just like that. This is a definitional thing. And if you recall, I told you that despite the fact that saying that the implication is true when the antecedent is false, that might be a little bit weird, that's the way that we should do it. Why is it the case that we actually have these vacuously true statements being called true instead of being called false? Well, I want to show you here why we do that. You might be thinking to yourself, instead of having vacuously true statements, these implications that don't really have much bite to them precisely because the antecedent is false, why don't we just switch the truth values around to look like this? Why isn't it the case that definitionally we say that the implication is defined as being true only when both the antecedent and consequent are true and false in every other situation? Well, I want to again show you why that's the case here in this lecture, and I'm going to do that by talking about the biconditional. So P if and only if Q. This is the truth table for P if and only if Q. Remember that the biconditional, going back to the lecture when I introduced the biconditional, is nothing more than combining both implications from both sides of the biconditional. So we have if P then Q. Notice I've switched the truth value, the vacuously true statements where p is false back to being true in that third column if p then q for the fourth column we have if q then p so we've just flipped the implication around and then in the last column we have p if and only if q again remembering back to that lecture that introduced the biconditional the biconditional is just the conjunction of those two implications so if p then q and if q then p so if we make that replacement in the truth table in the right column, we no longer have P if and only if Q. We have if P then Q and if Q then P. Those are the exact same things, but having this replacement here is a bit easier for us to work with if we've never seen a biconditional before because we know how conjunctions work in these truth tables. So let's fill in the rest of this truth table. When is the fourth column if Q then P true? Well, when we have vacuously true statements, it's going to be true in that first row when both P and Q are true. And it's going to be true in both the second row and the fourth row, because in the second row and the fourth row, Q is false, so the implication is vacuously true. And it's only in that third row, where Q is true and P is false, that the implication is false. Because P is not actually being implied by Q here, because we have Q being true, but P being false. So that's why we have a false in that case. So we have true in the first case, vacuously true in the second case, false in the third case, and vacuously true in the fourth case. Now we're prepared to fill in that fifth column, which is the conjunction of the previous two implications. Remember that a conjunction is true if and only if both of the component parts are true. So if we look down the third and the fourth column, when are those both true? Well, they're both true in the first row and they're both true in the fourth row. 
in the middle two rows, at least one of them is false. So we fill in that fifth column as being true in the first case, being false in the middle two cases, and being true in the last case. So now that we have that, why is it the case that we don't have vacuously true statements being false? Well, let's switch this back to being P if and only if Q. And now let's switch the truth values of the vacuously true statements to being false. In this case, we have for P if and only if Q only being true in that top row where both P and Q are true. Now, because the conjunction of the third and the fourth columns, the both of those implications, the conjunction of those two is false in the fourth row because both of them are false. So the truth value of the biconditional is false in that last case. But this does not fly, and here's why. The biconditional, remember, is what we think of as equality in logic. It's the equivalent of the algebraic equal sign in logic. It says that P and Q are essentially the same thing. When P is true, Q is true. When P is false, Q is false. When Q is true, P is true. When Q is false, P is false. In other words, they have the exact same logical identity. Notice here that this is not going with that story when we have vacuously true statements being marked down as false. I want you to look at the first two columns. If P, or rather P and Q, so the first two columns, you'll notice that in the first row, both of those are true. They have the same logical identity. They're equivalent. And you'll notice that in the fifth row, when we have the biconditional, P if and only if Q, we have that being marked down as true. So that has successfully recovered the fact that P and Q are logically equivalent in this case. In the second row, P is true and Q is false. They're no longer logically equivalent. So the biconditional should recover that fact. We see that in the fifth column, second row, we have a false marker there. So that's right. It's not the case in that second row that P and Q are logically equivalent. Same story in the third row. This time P is false and Q is true. So the biconditional should be marked down as false. Still good so far. But then you hit that fourth row. Here, P and Q are logically equivalent. They're both false. So the biconditional should recover that equality. It should be the case that P and Q are logically equivalent. And yet, because we have marked down vacuously true statements as being false, the conjunction of those vacuously true statements is false as well. And so the biconditional does not recover the fact that P and Q are logically equivalent. That is not the case when we have vacuously true statements being marked down as false. Now, with the vacuously true statements being now being true, once again, you see that in the fourth row where both P and Q are false, then both of those conditionals are vacuously true. So we have true markers now in the fourth row in columns three and four. And we have the biconditional in the fifth column, fourth row, accurately recovering the fact that P and Q are logically equivalent. And that's why we need vacuously true statements to be true. Otherwise, we lose out on this ability to recover the fact that in these cases where P and Q are false, we have logical equivalence. So that's why we mark down vacuously true statements as being true, and that's how you work with implications and truth tables. So I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time when we talk more about how to write things down in truth tables. Join me then.